Get the ultimate experience in cleanliness and comfort without breaking the bank when you transform your bathroom with Niagara. From toilets to bidets, Niagara has the perfect solution for any bathroom project. Niagara's award-winning products not only outperform the competitors, they also outdesign them. Thanks to innovations like stealth technology, Niagara's environmentally friendly products can use only half as much water as their competitors, conserving water and saving you money. And there's more great news for homeowners. You can now shop for Niagara products on Amazon or HomeDepot.com. Thank you, Niagara. What a week in sports from the highs to the lows. Welcome back. John Radigan, Nate Newton. It's brought to you by Niagara. And Nate, I've been sitting in this tiny studio for about 45 minutes and nobody's told me nothing. But you know what, John? Let me tell you something, man. And this podcast is going to be live, like you say, John. The highs with the Rangers and the lows with the Cowboys. We're going to tell you where both teams are at right now and what they should be doing, John. But we're going to start with these mighty, mighty Rangers. About these Rangers with a sweep of Tampa Bay. Since we last talked, Nate, they yes. swept Tampa Bay, the team that had the second best record in the American League. And then they hauled off and swept Baltimore, the team with the best record in the American League. And they did it exactly the way we talked about last week, Nate. They did it mostly with starting pitching. Now, the offense is going to come and go, but that starting pitching, it's going to take you where you need to go. It can take them all the way to the promised land. Nathan Evaldi looked like the all-star Nathan Evaldi in both of his starts so far in the playoffs, particularly in that game three of the American League Championship Series against Baltimore, who comes out a 101-win team, Nate, with their backs against the wall. Baldy just, as we say, you know, stuck it to him. <laughs> but, you know, Joe, once again, now I, I'm, I am the casual fan. And when I was into baseball deep, when me and Joe used to be back in the day and I used to be into it deep, uh, we used to do a little stuff with ESPN, with Fox and with yeah. uh, with just several people. It seemed like me and John would always find a way back to each other, like two lost ships in the sea. We always <laughs> find our way back to each other. Now, John. Walk us through, because we haven't been on in a while, so walk us through game one, two. Give us the highlights, the lowlights, and how did how did they eventually sweep this uh, great Baltimore team? Yeah, so the big concern going into really the whole postseason, but this playoff series in particular, the American League Divisional Series, was would the bullpen be able to withstand you know, whatever came at it. You know, the Rangers started game one basically with what they call during the regular season a bullpen day. That's right, the right. weakness. That's the weakness of their team is the bullpen. And they started it with the guy, Andrew Heaney, who had been relegated to the bullpen earlier in the year because there were, you know, there was an abundance of starting pitching, right? right. And so they start with a bullpen guy. They win that game three to two basically behind the efforts of you know Andrew Heaney and Dane Dunning and then Aroldis Chapman came in and did his wow, thing. Wow, that's a and blast Oz, from the past. Oh, oh that's, that's <laughs> a bad man. Hey, you wouldn't want to see him on a football field, Nate. Aroldis right, right. Chapman, he is a big, bad man when he's got it going. And then they, uh, uh, Jose LeClerc, who's just the opposite, soft-spoken, sweetest man in the world. You'd love this guy, Nate. Such mm. a great guy. We call him Pico. Anyway, he has found that magic that he had early in his career. And, and he's got, they call it a slambio. Uh, he's got the slambio work and it fools right. people. It's a little bit like Omariano Rivera used to yeah. do for the Yankees for all those years. Rivera threw the cutter. Everybody knew the cutter was coming. Right. Still couldn't hit it, right? Yes. That's where... That's where Jose LeClerc seems to be landing right now. So that's a beautiful thing when you got someone you can count on in the ninth inning. So wow. they win game one with their bullpen. It's a bullpen day. It's the weakness wow. of the team. Wow. Well, that bolsters them. That bolsters them, Nate. So what do they yeah. do? They come out and get up nine to two in game two. They had a wow. nine to two lead. You I see mean, offense just, come and go. Yeah. But see, like to me, the last two games, the yeah. offense done came a whole lot. 
Yeah, it can. And it'll get streaky. It'll get streaky on you. Right. And they hope it stays on this good streak, right? Because they're right. going to probably gonna probably face the Astros next. But that game, too, that thing was really over in the second or third inning as they got wow. nine on the board before, you know, the Orioles could do anything. And, and give the Orioles credit. They came back. Rangers ended up putting up 11. Uh, and the Orioles came back, I think, got it to 11-8. Maybe, mm-hmm. yeah, the bullpen, the bullpen faltered a little bit that right. day. But they didn't lose, right? They didn't lose. Oh, they won the game. Oh, that's what about it. Yeah. day, win the game. Yeah. yeah. And then they come in uh, on the game three, and there's O'Corey Seager. I mean, this dude owns Globe Life Field in October. He mm-hmm. remember he won the MVP of the World Series and the National League Championship Series, both of which were played in Globe Life Field. Wow. Uh, he won MVP of both those series in 2020 with the Dodgers when they won the World Series there. So now he gets back home for the first time in this postseason home run, first inning, set the tone. Nathan Navaldi nails, man. He is just, you could just see his body language, Nate. He's just you, stomping Joe. around. I yeah, he's stomping you. around out there. Man. man, he had good body language. So. Right. He takes care of his business really right away in the first inning, even before Corey batted. I'm sitting there with Mark McLemore, you know Mac, and, right, and I'm right. sitting with uh, Dave Raymond, who does the games on, on TV for Bally, and, and I looked at those guys, I go, I think we got the good of Aldi tonight. And they said, oh, right. boy, do we ever. Ball was yeah. moving, confidence was there, body language was right, there. Right, so right. Wow. the team almost got bolstered by that. And then the crowd, Nate, the crowd. Oh, my gosh. So this will tell you everything you need to know about the crowd last night. In the second inning, I think it was, Mm -hmm. Nathaniel Lowe comes to the plate, and he puts together one of those 15-pitch at-bats. Now, he had ended up in an easy fly ball to left field. It was an out. But on on the 14th pitch, he fouled another one off. Right. And the crowd gave him a standing ovation. The crowd was so into it, they gave a foul ball a standing ovation, <laughs> realizing that when you when you work a pitcher for fourteen pitches, yes, you sir. are letting you are letting your teammates see every single thing that dude has. Right. That's right. That's Any right. pitch he has in his arsenal today was just on display. Because Nathaniel Lowe worked him for 15 pitches in one well, at bat. Well, did the guy eventually just give up and throw him a knuckleball? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that'd have been great. Every pitch yeah. you can throw. Yeah. It, it, hey, the last thing you got is a knuckleball because your arms yeah. wore out. <laughs> right? Yeah, throw him an Ephus pitch, you know, like a softball. I <laughs> yeah. come in. There. Oh, Nate would knock that thing out of the yard. But yeah. Uh, yeah, it was it was really a great at bat and just a great moment for. Um, a a uh, fan base that has been accused in the past by none other than the great Josh Hamilton when he left mm-hmm. here to go to the mm-hmm. Angel. He said, well, you know, Texas really isn't a baseball town. It's a football town. That may be true. That may be true. But I'm going to yeah. say this. There's some damn good baseball fans here, and 40,000-plus were there at that ball yard for game three of the ALCS, and they were loving it. They blew the roof off that place, Nate. You, you know... Uh, you know, I, I tell people all the time, and I used to kind of cringe when I was a younger guy, John. But what I what what I am is I'm not I'm not a Maverick fan. I'm not a, okay. a Ranger fan. Right. But I am a state of Texas fan. Right. I am a Metroplex fan. And whenever our local sports, be it the Mavericks, our soccer team, maybe uh, the baseball team. The, the minor league baseball teams, whatever it is, I want our fans to have a good time, and and that's yeah. what that's what I'm about. I'm I'm not about the Rangers, the Mavericks, and sometimes not even about the Cowboys. I am about our fans who I see from training camp, whether it's the Mavericks, whether it's the Rangers, whether it's uh, the Cowboys. Our fans travel. So that means they spend a lot of money on paraphernalia, food, lodging. And when you go from spring training all the way through now, going to the A yeah. what ALCS, yep. it's fans buying tickets, man, almost and uh, hawking their houses, you know, moving yep. around the bills so these they, so they can see their Rangers. I'm telling you, I'm a fan of that. I'm a fan of people that 
back their team, put their money where their mouth at. And that's one thing about it. If you're winning and you're trying, you don't have to be always successful with these fans that we have. But if you're always trying to be the best you can be like the Rangers, I know they're shocking people. A lot of people tell you this is where they belong. Yes, they are because they have shown you this is where they belong. But you couldn't have told me months ago that this is where the Rangers would be, especially at you the know, end of the year when that thing fell off. Yeah, and it's it's a great point you make because, you know, two off seasons ago, they spent a half a billion dollars on free agents and right. they only improved – you know, from 102 losses to 96 losses or some such. Right. You know, they only got six wins better after spending a half a billion dollars on right. mostly Marcus Simeon and Corey Seager. John Gray was in there, too. Right. Anyway, they didn't improve that much. So you're like, OK, this year they spent another, I don't know, a quarter <laughs> of a billion, 250 right. million bringing pitchers in. Now you're like, OK, maybe they'll improve. You know, they'll improve. They're not going to be like winning the World Series this year. Nate, they got a shot at winning that thing this year. This next series, like I say, probably going to be against Houston. They won. They're up 2-1 to one in their uh, ALDS, um, and they play a game four in Minnesota. Okay. But anyway, it's probably going to be, a you know, speaking of a, a Texas battle, right? It's going to yes, be yeah. two Texas teams, man, battling for the tra- chance to go to the World Series. And they're two teams that, you know, have really – develop quite a nice rivalry quickly uh so man it, it'll be really fun but you're you're right about these fans and i remember it from back in the day when when i was traveling with you guys and it was my first experience with the cowboys and every bus we would get off in yeah. any city washington dc you know <laughs> uh, new york when we yeah. land over there anywhere we got off the bus at the hotel lined with cowboys fans man it was it was pretty cool to see now, now, a, just a quick preview before we get into the lows of the okay. Sports I hate the lows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so, a quick oh, the, preview. Oh, the preview, preview yeah. of the ALCS. Yes, give but me a quick preview yeah. for the fans. So they need to know. Yeah, it's going to depend. It's going to depend on if it is the Astros, but I'm going to assume it is the Astros, and mm. um, and that Nate, I believe that's going to be a war. It starts in Houston by virtue of the fact that they won the division right. on the last day of the season. And I think I think I said this last week, and mm-hmm. if I didn't, I'm going to say it now. What happened with that Ranger team when they lost that game, the final game 162 against Seattle, they lost that game one to nothing. They were criticized about celebrating too much um, when they when they clinched the playoffs the night before, um, and that was BS. They didn't celebrate too much. They celebrated in the locker room, but they didn't right. take it beyond there. They just right. had a bad game on Sunday. They lost. But you know what? They A lot of those guys, Nate, they felt like crap. They felt terrible. They're like, oh, my God, we failed. And what they told each other internally was, we don't ever want to have this feeling again. This feeling sucks. And the only way we avoid this feeling from here on out is to win every game we play from here on. And they've done that since then. They've won five in a row in the playoffs against the two teams with the best records in the American League. Now they have the Astros. That's a different animal. A- been there and done that right they've been to the world series they've been the american league championship series six out of seven years they are the bell cow they're the standard against which all american league teams are measured uh but the great thing is these two teams are extremely familiar with each other so you know the rangers know what they need to do to beat the astros and vice versa and i believe it will make for some fantastically dramatic enjoyable baseball and so I, I think it's probably one of those nate that goes seven games maybe six i like six for the rangers to win because you'd hate to have to go back to minute made and win a game seven so let's have the rangers all off and figure out a way to win it in six and uh and then they'd go on to the world series and and you know the way the braves have struggled that's the team that had the best record in baseball the way the braves have struggled uh against the phillies in this in this champion or this divisional series Maybe they're not invincible, all right? <laughs> May, hey, right now Vegas has the Rangers as the favorite to win the World Series. That's oh, I'm all I'm tell saying. You something. That was a great segue into what I like what you said was the fact that these guys felt bad. Yeah. They 
had a chance. They know the Astros. They know who they are. Cowboys, 49ers. Yeah. We know who they are. They know who they yeah. are. But the difference is with the Cowboys, they have lost three now, including the playoffs. I wonder, did someone on that team, a leader or two on that team, come in and say, hey, fellas, time to close the mouth, stop talking to the public, stop with all the big-time podcasts, and say, you know what, fellas? The only way we can rectify this is to win games. What 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 happened was not a good thing. Uh, I can't think of games where uh, once we had had winning seasons back to back where we just imploded. I mean, it wasn't right. explosion. In one way, I think the Forty Niners exploded on them. I think they imploded themselves once they got punched in the mouth. You remember the uh, the the uh, the roughing, unnecessary roughing yeah. on the receiver, and then you know yeah. my man. Uh, uh, you know, stood over him, number one. Uh, uh, yeah. Curse stood over him, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it was going to be a penalty regardless of, of what went down. We never recovered. Uh, our first three series, offensively, we did nothing. Then we put together right. a drive. We did nothing. Uh, our special teams basically did nothing. Uh, we lost Leighton Van Der Esch during that game. We lost mm. uh, C.J. Goodwin during that game. Our top. Special teams guy, and then we lose our leader for us lining guys up, running the defense, understanding where everybody's supposed to be. We lost that guy to our so not only did they uh mentally punish us, they physically punished us. And uh, you you see, Rad, all the back and forth. Uh, I don't understand that. Uh, I don't understand the back and forth. And I know I'm kind of just touching a whole lot of areas, but they need yeah. to be touched. Uh, when you lose consecutively, back to back to back, it's time to be quiet, pull yourself together, pull your team together. And I'm talking about the leaders of the team. Not go have a team meeting. I've never seen a players team meeting that got that went public because in nothing the cowboy does that it's not gonna go public. Where some player mm -hmm. gonna run out and say, "Hey, Rag, guess what? Hey, mm -hmm. hey, Archer, guess what? Mm -hmm. You know, yep. we 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 talk to somebody. We are gonna talk to somebody." And yep. they said, "Oh, the Cowboys had a players only team meeting, and all of a sudden they know more than the coaches know." So yep. let me start here, Rag, and give me two or three minutes. Yeah, yeah, please, please. If I'm Coach McCarthy, if I'm Quinn, the defensive coordinator, and Coach McCarthy, I said him, you know, because he's the offensive coordinator, I will pull my players in as a group. I will pull my players in as, as head coach and offensive coordinator. I will pull all my players in. And I will say, look here, this is how things are going to be ran. We got enough circulating in the media. We got people starting to take shots, biting at one another, coaches. But that's not going to happen on my watch. If I'm Coach McCarthy, I'm stopping that. And then I'm, if I'm Dan Quinn, I'm pulling in my defensive players and saying the same thing repeatedly, what Coach has just said. And if you have an issue with the head coach or the way something is being done, come to me and let's keep this thing in-house because – once you start taking shots, you know, you know, uh, I've read things where Micah has taken his shots, uh, where C.D. Lamb is starting to separate mm -hmm. himself from the mm -hmm. team. You mm -hmm. cannot have that after this type of loss. You know that. You know, hey, the Cowboys are nine and one after a, a loss. They, they, uh, uh, this was a different loss. Okay. You check the record of the 49ers in the last few years. Teams after playing the 49ers are one in 15. One win, 15 mm. losses. They wow. they not only take it out of you physically, they take it out of you mentally. Wow. That the is Cowboys big. and their fans thought they were one thing. The 49ers showed you you are another. So now, what do you do? You go in house. John, I, I'm not saying do not fulfill your obligations to the media. If you have a time to talk, but talk with wisdom. 
Talk with knowledge. Talk with which what you can control. You can't control what's happening with the 49ers. That is over. But you can control what's going to happen with the L.A. Chargers. They have a fundam, uh, a, a, a great team. They have good wide receivers. They have a nice running back. They have a, 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 a ultra talented quarterback. I, I mean, this guy ceiling is is out here. I don't know if he'll reach it, but that and Herbert is a beast. And so, what are you going to do? And they have do? Kellen Moore. And they have yeah. Kellen Moore. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you don't want to underrate these guys, man, because you still bickering with the 49ers. And I'm talking about Michael Parsons. Somebody got somebody has to talk to this kid and say, look at your homeboy. This is how we do it in the NFL. You are a great player that has been neutralized not once, not twice, but three times against the every time we play a team in the higher elite category, he do, he's not the factor. When we play the average to below average, he kills them. Mm-hmm. The numbers will back it up. I told people before the game they was trying to compare him and Joey Bosa. And I didn't want to go against the Cowboys because, you know, I never do. But I tried to tell them, I say, what are y'all doing? The reigning MVP, defensive MVP, against an up-and-coming guy who has not played in a – won a second-round game like the, like, the, like the Rangers just did. Yeah, the Rangers finna go to the to the to the NFC Championship. That's what we call exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah, they finna, yep. that's the it. Rangers are, got quiet, and now they playing ball. Well, part of that is the media's fault, our fault, our fault for always talking Super Bowl. And I tell people, the the Joneses have a right to talk Super Bowl. Our fans have a right to talk Super Bowl. Players, you have to earn the right to talk Super Bowl. You get knocked out in the first round. It's hard to have aspirations to go to the Super Bowl, but it comes a point where you have to stop talking and start doing. And right now we're not at that point, John. And I just wanted to say that, you know, without getting too deep into what happened to the 49ers. No, that, that's yeah. fantastic. I mean, there's so many places I want to go, and we don't have a lot of time, but the first go, place that yes. I think I want to go with mm-hmm. that is, okay, so after the game, and, and I don't know if this is a training thing, right, for players mm-hmm. at this stage. Mark mm-hmm. McLemore gets so annoyed when he hears a, a young baseball player reveal too much in his interview, right? Don't tell them that, you know, your fastball wasn't working today because then they're looking for that next time. They're looking for signals that showed them the same thing. Hey, it wasn't working last time and he was doing this, you know, whatever. Okay. <laughs> I, okay. So that I, I, I heard this from the Cowboys. Now, veteran Stephon Gilmore, his interview after the game, man, it's one game. We're going to go back. We're going to look at the film. We have a lot of things to correct, but we're going to be better, right? You just very, very right. generic, very work. That's what you need to say, right? At that point. Yeah. Whereas, and I love Dak. We all do. He's a great leader. He's a great man. He's a great philanthropist. But Dak, after the game, and so many of these young people who do so much on social media anyway, right? Yeah. They they say too much, Nate. So he says, man. We thought we had the perfect game plan. We put everything together that we could possibly do, and we thought we were perfectly poised to beat this team, and you got killed, right? It reveals too much, man. Just say, (laughs) and Troy was the king of this. Troy used to bore people. People were surprised that Troy would be a broadcaster because he used to come out there and do interviews like, yeah, we get ready for football games. We play football games. We like to play football. You know what I mean? Like he just wouldn't say much. I don't know if you guys were trained to do that as far as – as it pertained to the media, but I think that's a skill that's a little bit lost with some of these younger players. <laughs> you are so right, man. The, the, the thing that, you know, we had Rich Dalrymple, bless his heart. Yeah. Yeah. We had Tech Shram, bless his heart. The thing that I, I tell young people don't know how to read the room. They're mm-hmm. not 
aware of what just happened. I was the craziest. Can't yes. say anything, do anything. Yep, you were. But when the games were being played and the games were finished, win, lose, or draw, I took my lead from my head coach, my quarterback, and my wide receiver. That was Jimmy Johnson, excuse me, Coach Landry, Jimmy Johnson, or Troy Aikman, or Michael Irvin. Because mm -hmm. they knew how to take the time and to read the room. And I'll give you an example. I listened to the young man, Parsons, after the game. And I said in my mind, you, you are not reading the room. Jerome, uh, Javon Curse does not feel the way you feel. Uh, uh, the left guard does not feel the way you feel. The right guard, the right tackle does not feel the way you feel. These guys got didn't have their typical A game. They didn't even have their typical B game. It was ugly. And these guys don't feel that way. They don't feel uh, like you, they were equal to the task. Because if they felt that way, the game would have been much closer, much, much closer, and the competition would have been greater. We seem to not even compete that game. Now you're taking shots at your coaches. You're telling everybody that you're on their level. And yes, as a professional athlete, y'all are on that level. You were drafted. You play in the NFL. But on that playing field, you did not show you was on that level. Be mm -hmm. it the bad coaching, be it not the right play call, be it you not executing. You didn't read the room. What should have been said after that game is, hey, we have another game tomorrow yep. or next Sunday. We have to look at this film, learn from it, see what we need to do to be better, make our adjustments, and come play football. Now, I, I, I just want to quote a coach that is going through it. And you should know who this coach is. You people out there in, in, in TV land or viewing land. They asked a certain coach after this week, he got beat, he got blanked for the first time in, a, in his career, I think. And they said, Coach, what are you going to do? We're going to start over. We're going to start from the beginning. And we're going to do this again. And everybody like, and I called and they said, Coach Belichick, what did, what did you just say? Have you ever done this before? Yes, I've started over in the middle of the season. We're going to start over. Wow. And we're going to do yeah. it again. And that's yeah. all he would give them. But he not going to give fantastic. you what went wrong. He not going to give mm -hmm. you what went right. He just telling you we going you going to see something different. We going to start over. The Rangers did not uh, go out on the field and party. They went into their locker room, and those that were exposed to that little bit of limited time of celebration. But somebody in there, whether it was the the manager, whether it was ownership, whether it was a player sitting there saying, "Man, this did." We should have won this game. And the only way we yeah. can change this, and the only way the Cowboys can change this is to, is to win this game coming up, the L.A. Chargers. Boy, you know, so great. The other thing I wanted to ask you, and I think you've answered it by your tone and by you how, how you feel, but you know, as I do, we all always overreact to a Cowboys win or to a loss, right? They beat the yeah. Giants and the Jets in the first couple of weeks, man. Everybody's got them in the Super Bowl. Oh my gosh, this is the best defense ever, right? You know, this this ranks up there with the 85 Bears, you know? I mean, this is unbelievable, right? And then, of course, we've now seen, I mean, they lost to Arizona, for goodness sake. They, they got drilled by San Francisco. We've seen it's not all that. It's not bad, but it's not all that. But my question then is, Nate, are we similarly overreacting to this loss. Now, it, it seems to me from your tone and from what you've been saying, we are not overreacting to this loss. Well, me and you are not. We've, we've played enough football and we've seen enough football and we've been a part of enough competitive sports to know <laughs> that this don't have to be over. But we also know that if they don't rein this in 
and figure out who they are and what they're trying to do and stay disciplined in doing that, that this thing can snowball out of, out of, out of place. We've seen too many talented teams not reach their potential because they have already, I, I, you, you have people say, Hey man, don't miss the forest for the trees. Yeah. Well, coach Johnson would tell us, look at here, homeboy, that's a forest. We need to get to the other end. And the only way we can do that, and we talking about big redwoods, because we got 12 big redwoods, and all you see is the forest, the enormity of it. Now what you got to do is narrow down that focus. Now we got to chop down each redwood. Redwoods are some big old trees. Yeah. So now you got to figure out if you need a bandsaw on this one. Do you need a little chainsaw on this one? You know, you got to figure out how you got to do this thing, and you got to chop down every tree. If somebody's in your locker room talking Super Bowl, you just look at them and walk away. If somebody's asking you about the, you know, the NFC Championship game or the NFC East, you just look, hey, man, no comment. We got the charges. You got to be obsessed right now with how you're going to stop Herbert. How you're going to stop Joy Bosa. How you're going to stop Cleo Mack, who's got six sacks right now. Joy Bosa with three. They got 16 all together. How you going to stop a Duran James if he come back and plays the game, the big safety they got? How you going to stop uh, – Eckler, the running back. You got too many things. And Keenan Allen, how you going to stop? You know, this is what's before you right now. How are you going to handle this redwood? Are you going to sit there and be moping about, oh, man, they ain't better than the 49ers? If you keep thinking 49ers, you're going to miss something on that film. And all of a sudden, you're going to be like, they ain't the Chargers. And you're going to, and it's going to snowball on you. Yeah, I heard somebody say, and it was wise, you can't let the 49ers game beat you again. Right. If they do the 1 in 15 thing that you mentioned earlier in the show, <laughs> right? If they're one of the teams that loses the week after they lost to the 49ers, right. then they've the 49ers just beat them twice. Although the Chargers obviously will get credit for the second loss. I wonder about this too, Nate. Um and and this may be the last area we delve into on this on this loss, this this low of our highs and lows podcast right. this week. Uh uh the physicality, the physical nature of that 49ers team, man. I know it hurts me to watch too. <laughs> All you mentioned, you mentioned Le- uh, Leighton Vander Esch. You know he's out for four to six, and thank God it's only that because you know with that net going into Micah, it looked even worse, didn't it? I thought he had gotten two birds with one stone. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> and uh, and and uh, Goodwin, as you mentioned, he's out. But every but so many guys had to leave that game because the 49ers are so. Physical. It seems to me, at least in your heyday of the Cowboys, that you know that the nineties Cowboys bro. that won. That well, I thought so, us. right? But but so then the question becomes, Nate: Were you earlier eighty nine, ninety before you got to be you know who those Cowboys became? Were you on the receiving end of those kind of games at all, or or not? Go back and to the NFC East. Washington won a Super Bowl. The Giants won a Super Bowl, and we had to build our team. Jimmy built our team to compete with those guys first, the NFC East. And that's what how we got so physical with dealing with Lawrence Taylor, with with, with dealing with guys of, of that ilk, you know, the Charles Manns of the world, teams that were just physically defense where you wasn't going to run the ball. So if you couldn't run the ball, they made you one-dimensional, and you definitely weren't going to pass the ball because they had great pass rushers. So now that is – when you look at the 49ers, they play a four-man front, two defensive ends – Two defensive tackles, one in a, a head-up position over the guard, the other one in the outside out, depending on what the, the strength at, and they come at you. They tell you that Fred Warren is going to crush you, that Green Law is going to crush you, and that you cannot go on a 13-play drive on us because you will make a mistake. We're going to man you up, take away your short game, and we're going to lay hands on you. You're going to think we're a Baptist preacher. When we finish laying these hands on you, <laughs> you're going to feel something. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah. And that's what happened. Yeah. They out physical yeah. us. Uh, there's certain words you can't use in today's uh, vocabulary. Uh, back in the day, we would have said, you know, they did something else, but they they got they did what they had to do physically, mentally, you know. And I don't want to say spiritually because I hope they still praying to God that they get a second chance at these guys, these 49ers. 
<laughs> yeah, and they're going to need they're going to need a second chance, obviously, to try and redeem this. It looked like they had gotten closer, didn't it? With the yes. with the playoff game last year, that was yes, that sir. was a tight fit. That was a game that could have gone either way, obviously. And man, it it it, it just and so this this has to be because we're getting too long. But I, yeah. the last thing. Um, this offense. We talked about it last week, Nate, and we said this Texas coast is still, you know, a work in progress. And of course, one week later, it's even more evident that it is. Um, are there are there flaws to it that worry you big picture, right? It's or can fl- this still work? It's flaws to it uh, when you don't make the quick adjustment. We didn't, we didn't make the quick adjustment of... Uh, do we want to run a little bit more? You know, uh, do we want to try to uh, get some balls up in the air a little bit deeper? But you have to execute first. And we can moan and groan, uh, but we didn't execute. You didn't execute. The first three The first three series, you was three and out, four and out, five and out. You, you, you didn't execute. Uh, you, you, you could say you were open, but what about the times you was in man coverage and one open? What about the times you maybe was open and, he, and the boy had a blitzer in his face? Not a blitzer, but a, a down lineman in his face. So this thing took its time in breaking down. If it wasn't the receivers, the receivers was open, the, D, the O-line broke down. If the O-line didn't break down, the quarterback misread. Uh, it, it was ugly. These guys were well prepared, and they was ready for the big game. We were not big game attuned. Let me say this right quick, like Niagara. I'm telling you, I'm telling you while I'm sitting down on the potty. I'm letting you know right now where I'm sta- where I'm sitting at. This is win the game that's before you. Hopefully, mm-hmm. you can win the NFC East. You're two games down to Philadelphia. Win the NFC East, and let's see where it go from there. To talk about anything else will be blasphemy. Win the game before you. We got one big redwood. It's called the L.A. Chargers, led by Kellen Moore. Oh, man. <laughs> okay. Oh, man. It's juicy. <laughs> and, it's, and it's Monday night, Nate. It's Monday yes, night. Sir. Yeah, you, once again, you'll be on national TV. Don't embarrass so, yourself. Man, it's been fun. I want everyone to see your thoughts. I thought you were so honest and and so good in explaining what happened and what needs to happen. And, and man, I can't wait to do it again next week, Nate. Yes, sir. We flushed another one, Niagara. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) 